All right, it's two o'clock. Uh, so next up, we will have our former incarcerated panel. Today, we're lucky enough to hear the personal accounts of five camp survivors. Um, we have Tom Oshidari, who was incarcerated at Roar. We have Christine Umeda, who was incarcerated at Tuli Lake and Topaz. We have Koichi Nishimura, who was incarcerated at Manzanar. We have Marge Taniwaki, who was also incarcerated at Manzanar. And we have Marielle Tsukamoto, who was incarcerated at Jerome. Um, each of these former incarcerees will speak about their firsthand experiences from camp, how it impacted their family, how it shaped their perspective on the world, and how they live their lives today. Each panelist will have about seven minutes to talk, and then we'll save 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Um, so again, please use the Q&A feature. Um, if you have a specific question for a specific former incarceree, please uh, specify who you would like to reply um, by typing in their name. Um, or if it's just a general question, you can just say general question. Um, so first off, we have Thomas Shudari, the San Jose JCL co-president. Um, he'll kick us off. And Tom, I have your video or your pictures ready whenever uh, you want me to display them. I was born in Roar. And I, I guess I'm uh, at the extreme because I'm one of those who has no personal memories of the camp. We left when I was 15 months old. And, uh, we stayed a couple of years in Kansas City, Missouri, where my father who was a dentist. Tom, oh. can you talk a little closer to the to your computer, please? It's kind of hard to hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I was saying that we stayed in Kansas City, Missouri for a couple of years, where my father worked as a dental lab technician to earn money to be able to get back to Stockton. Oh, by the way, yeah, we, we were removed. They were removed from Stockton to go to Roar. And so um, it took a couple of years before we got back to Stockton. And um, Stockton then, and as today, I think, has a fairly diverse minority population. There were the Chinese, Japanese, Filipino, Hispanics, African-American, Italians, and other whites. And the town was uh, pretty much divided north and south. And on the south side, where the minorities lived, and the north side was primarily white, and where the rich people lived. But on the south side, the people got along, you know, it was, uh, I recall, you know, I don't recall any real racial issues. So I started school in kindergarten, and, uh, you know, they're too young there to have any racial prejudices. And from there, throughout school, you know, I never really uh, experienced any any racial discrimination, I would say, that I was aware of. And all this time, um, my parents never really talked about the camps. I think that was fairly typical of most of the adults who were incarcerated. Um, and I didn't really realize it at the time, but not only did they not talk about the camps, they didn't talk about the past at all, in general. So, really, you know, I never really learned much of anything about their past, and I didn't really have the insight to think that they really had a past. I mean, to me, they were just my parents, and you just kind of take that for granted. And so, you know, I grew up just thinking that we were just an ordinary middle-class family. My father was a dentist. It seemed like an ordinary middle-class occupation. So 
I never really, never really gave it much thought. So this kind of, you know, just carried through all the way through college. I got to the South Bay area after college. Eventually got married. We had two boys in the mid seventies. Kind of got involved in kids' activities. In the eighties, I was coaching CYS basketball, ninja basketball, and there was also the uh, was JCL track meet. It was the regional meet that was held an annually, and I ended up being the coordinator and coach for that for, for over 20 years. And uh, in the 80s, when the redress movement was going on, I was totally unaware of it. And it was only uh, later in the 90s, really, that my tie to the JCL through that track meet eventually got me pulled into the JCL, San Jose JCL board. And then that's really when I started to really learn about the incarceration and the discrimination against Japanese in the pre-war. So all of my education in that area has really come in like the last 20, 25 years. And unfortunately, it was too late that I, I realized that you know, my parents did have a story to their lives, and I never learned about it. It was, it was too late. And, uh, you know, I realized that my father being a dentist really was a big deal because he had no role models among the Issei. And he grew up in, a, in an atmosphere of institutionalized discrimination against Japanese. And yet somehow he managed to aspire to become a dentist. And I don't know his story of how that came about. And uh, I'm never gonna know that story. I didn't uh, you know, try to bring up the topic of incarceration a few times with my mother, and she was not comfortable in talking about it. Uh, she didn't want to talk about it. She was never interested in reunions, pilgrimages. She just didn't want to remember it at all. So. The impact of the incarceration on me, on my family. I mean, apparently during the going up years, there was no impact. But what it really was, was it closed the door to history, essentially. Because my parents didn't talk about that. And they didn't talk about the past in general. And I didn't realize until too late that and they had stories to their lives that I, I should know. And I missed out on, on being able to hear them. So that's that's really kind of the impact on me. And uh, you know, since then I, you know, I'm, I'm now co-president of the San Jose JCL. And I feel of an obligation to make sure that the stories do get told. That's, that's where I am. So that's, that's my story. Tom, I'm going to share the picture that you have on the screen now. Yeah, that's a picture of my mother and me and my older brother at Rower. That's when I was uh, 
probably a little less than a year old. My brother's about two and a half. So, just a memory. Tom, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, some people would like to know if you've ever been back to Arkansas, been back to Roar. Uh, yes, I did uh, on my own. Uh, this is back about what, 20 years ago, maybe. I had the opportunity uh, on a work assignment to work in Texas. So I took a weekend and I took a drive to Roar just to take a look. And uh, it was like going back into time because uh, it's like time stood still there. There's nothing there except the cemetery, basically. And uh, you know, even the, the town there, or the McGee, I guess, I stayed in a motel there. And uh, the telephone system there was a party line system, which Many of you may not even know what that is, but the phones used to be party lines where you had to share the phone, and that still existed in, in Medici there 20 years ago. Uh, since then, I guess they've, they've built a museum and they've got, they've got, uh, it's become one of the National Historic Sites, so I guess there's a lot more to it. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really been back there since. All right. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Tom. Um, we'll save the other questions that were intended for you until the end of the, the panel. We'll next move on to Christine. Are we live? Yes, we are. And I also have your uh, pictures ready, so just let me know whenever you want me to share them on the screen. Oh, great. Thanks so much, Melanie. No problem. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Christine Asso Umeda, and I'm joining you from Sacramento, California. And I'm happy to be a part of this inaugural event. You know, sadly, there are a few survivors who have really the vivid memories that most people would like to hear. And so it's really fallen on us who were children in the camps. And my personal experience began in May of 1942. I was four. My family of seven children and parents were forced to move to Arboga Assembly Center, and that's near Marysville, California. We were incarcerated for three and a half years, first in Tilly Lake, then Topaz, and then I was separated from my family, and that experience alone has had a great impact on my life. Two weeks after arriving in Arboga, I came down with pneumonia and I was transferred to a local community hospital. I had nightmares through most of my, of my life, and, and I remember being placed in a darkened van without windows and the door closing and screaming. I was an adult when my sisters finally helped put the uh, pieces together of that dream. Apparently, the center administrator would not allow my mother or my sisters to accompany me. I was hospitalized alone for four days. That traumatic uh, ex experience effectively erased all my memories of my stay in Tule Lake. And I only have a few things that I recall from our stay in Topaz. It, actually, uh, Melanie, you might want to show that photograph of me and a friend while we were in Topaz to give you sort of a snapshot of what it was like. <laughs> so that was in Topaz, uh, probably about 1944. I wish I knew who that young woman, a uh, young girl is. And if by chance anyone recognize her, please let me know. I'd like to be in contact with her. Thanks, Melanie. No problem. So that traumatic experience of being separated affected, you know, really affected my memory. 
in terms of any of my camp experience. So in retrospect, I know that these experiences became the driving force of what would, you know, what I would do with my life. One especially was reclaiming my cultural heritage for myself and for my children. And two, educating students and others about the Japanese American experience and the Constitution. And three, advocating for social justice. Fast forward to the 70s and the civil rights movement. It was a time when all ethnic groups began asking the same question. What about our cultural identity and change? It was an exciting time, particularly in Sacramento. There was a flurry of activity, all focused around meeting social, educational, and service needs of the Asian community. What emerged was the Japanese Community Center, now known as the Asian Community Center, a bilingual mental health services to Asians, and especially the thing that had the closest to my heart, Jankin Fugako, a summer school program for children to learn about their cultural heritage. And that was just a few of the programs. My first involvement in social justice began with Mary Tsukumoto and her efforts in the redress movement to educate our community to speak before the commission hearings and advocating for an apology and reparation. This began more than 35 years of planning Day of Remembrances, as well as becoming a docent at the California Museum. At the museum, we educated students about the incarceration experience and constitutional rights, and also those that were denied. In the last years, reports and images began emerging about the families seeking asylum and the children who are being separated from their families in our northern borders. These images had a particular personal effect on me because of my separation from my parents. My involvement with the foreign JCL, yay for foreign JCL, and Sudu for Solidarity has channeled the hurt and anger of that incarcerated experience and has become the next stage of my life in supporting social justice. With our history of standing alone during World War II, when few people stood up for us, it's imperative that we stand up and speak out for others. As my granddaughter describes me, Bachan, you're always protesting. What a great remembrance. Thank you. This might be a good place to show the protest that my granddaughter accompanied me to at the Matsui Courthouse. That's it. Christine, some people were wondering um, if you know what block you were in at Topaz. You know, uh, block 39 and Barrick 4. Very cool. Thank you for yeah, sharing. We were late arrivals, so the Bay Area folks were in the front of the facility. Um, another question that's been asked is how you have that family photo or that picture of yourself in camp? Um, you know, um, we had very few uh, artifacts that were left in our family because they were destroyed while we were gone. But apparently my parents' church, for some reason, had those photographs. So I'm really grateful. That's one of the few things that uh, you know we have of that period of our life. Let's see. Um, one more question. Um, someone is wondering, um, did you go to Manzanar from Florin? Is that where you were living before? Or sorry. Um, no, we never went to Manzanar. It's just that the Florin JCL, we've done pilgrimages for the last 15 years. And thank you, Melanie and Maddie, for organizing the one for San Jose. <laughs> That's my connection. No problem. You are a great mentor for us. Um, one more really quick question. Um, can you speak to what it's like to protest with your granddaughter and teach younger generations about social justice? Actually, that was a one-time event, and it was purely coincidental. We were <clears throat> actually at the John Kipogako uh, program, and it was coming down in, and I, and of course, didn't have much time, so with permission from her dad, she went with me. And Mariel was there, too. So it was a good experience. I'm not sure what really impact it had on her, but uh, I was so grateful. And hey, it appeared in the Sacramento Bee, and that person that was taking the photo was 
that make my favorite photojournalist, Paul Kitagaki Jr. Very cool. <laughs> All right, there's a couple more questions, but we'll save those to the end. Um, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us, Christine. Um, we'll next go to Ko Nishimura. Ko, are you ready? Sure, anytime. All right. Need a video. Yeah, your video is off right now. Okay, there we go. Um, I look a little shaggy. Uh, I'm 81 years old. I haven't been able to get to the barber shop, so pardon my looks but it doesn't matter at my age, I suppose. Well, um, I was born and raised in Pasadena, California until 20, uh, except for the internment years. I was born uh, by midwife uh, because in Pasadena, uh, my mother could not go to, go to the uh, Huntington Memorial Hospital because they didn't want to let Japanese in there. At that time, it was 1938. Uh, <clears throat> I can't... Uh, uh, it's sort of, my story is sort of unusual. Before I do, uh, my wife uh, would be here, except she's got Alzheimer and she's locked up in a in a, a rest home. She went to, to she went to Santa Anita to to row her to Tula Lake, and she got deported to Japan right after the war. And she spent through junior high school in Japan, and came back after that 1955 finished high school. Went, went to junior college in Pasadena, went to UCLA, and graduated out of U University of California, San Francisco Medical School as a physical therapist. Now, getting back to me, uh, we uh, decided that we could go inland, and we fled to Reedley, California, where the authorities caught up with us. And uh, if you look at the Manzanar plaque where we all came from, it says we're from the Fresno area. And my friends always said they made a mistake when they go to see the museum there. I said, no, no, that's where we went to camp from. That's an unusual story because I think we were headed for Tula Lake. Through the Freedom of Information Act, I got my uncle's file. My uncle, Shinpei Nishimura. And, um, he worked on the Guayali Project. We could talk about that later. But uh, there was a project in camp uh, called the Guayali Project. And... Uh, and uh, he was the head scientist there under the uh, uh, direction of Dr. Robert Emerson, a plant physiologist from Caltech. What they did was they were looking at uh, uh, yielding uh, rubber or latex from a, a, um, a, a, a shrub, plant, a old, old sagebrush that grew in the desert. And... Uh, uh, if you go to Manzanar, you probably see it. And I think Patricia Briggs, the, the ranger is from from uh, Manzanar, is on this session, so you could you can inquire about what that is. Well, anyway, um, it was only a quirk of of, of, of uh, uh, luck that uh, we went to to Manzanar. We didn't arrive in Manzanar like everybody else. We got hauled off from uh, Fresno, but there's a little story behind that. You see, Dr. Emerson wanted my uncle to be the head scientist. I have all the documentation that goes with that on the Guadalupe project. He had to go all the way up to the department, the Secretary of War, to get that permission. You see, my uncle was an alien. He came to America when he was seven. And he also answered no, no for the family. So he had two strikes against him. I have all the interrogation they did to him. It must have been an insult to him. That's been some of the dumbest questions I could think of. Anyway, instead of going to Tula Lake, we were directed into Manzanar. Um, I know when my uncle left Fresno, he went with Dr. Emerson. We, I know what time they arrived in Manzanar. It's all documented. I know what time I got to Manzanar, 8 o'clock in the morning with my family. They, they told us the people that drove us there and who was in the party. And matter of fact, uh, there's one person on from Los Angeles, uh, the person I grew up with, Gary Hata, is also on that list. He came with us. You see, his father was somebody my uncle wanted him to work with because he knew how to grow plants. He was a nursery man also. And um, we were sent to Manzanar. 
The other thing that I know is that uh, we also had a truck go to Manzanar because you see, we had, unlike most most people that went to camp, we didn't. We had the luxury of not only taking one suitcase, but since we were caught in Fresno and they're going to haul, haul us out <laughs> to Manzanar, we had a truckload of furniture, and uh, there was a. So we, I know the names of the people that drove the truck and the car. So it's all documented in the file. Uh, how we got the man's and arm, of course, uh, we couldn't use most of the, the things that uh, we had. So my grandmother and my mother gave most of the stuff away because we couldn't get it into our, our room. Um, all of us lived in this 20 by 20 room. My mother, my father, my grandmother, and my uncle. <laughs> and uh, and um, of course, my grandfather wasn't there because he was in uh, Missoula, Montana, in the federal prison. He was one of the first guys that got hauled off. Matter of fact, uh, on, on Pearl Harbor morning, I was the I was the child that opened the door when there was two FBI agents in the door and asked for my grandfather. He went back and talked to my grandmother, got his coat. That's the last we saw him until early 1945. We didn't know where he was. He was uh, then he he was in Missoula, and then he was first went sent to Terminal Island, then to Missoula, Montana, then he went to Livingston, I think Louisiana, then he ended up at Santa Fe, New Mexico, and then from there he was shuttled off back to Manzanar when things got safe, I guess. What do I remember about Manzanar? I was fairly young. I remember how hot it was. I remember the, the dust storms. I could tell you one dust storm. We had so much dust in our room that I, I laid on the on, on the cot uh, on an on on issued army blanket. And when after the storm was over, I got up and I could see my silhouette. That's how dusty it was in the room. You couldn't breathe otherwise. Uh, it was hot in the summertime, cold in the wintertime. Um, of course, Manzanar was the north end of Death Valley, so it got up over 110, I think. You know, it was really hot, I remember, during the summer. I remember, I don't remember much about going to school, except we had to cross a fire break. And on the, on the dusty day, oh, heck, that was really a mess because you, you get almost choked to get, get back home. We lived in block 35, which was the end block, the very north eastern corner, and we lived on the last barrack. What I remember was every night I'd see the searchlight go through the windows as we, as, as we slept at night, and uh, you wake up in the middle of the night, you see the searchlight going by from the, the, to the guard tower at the corner, which we're very close to. Um, so those, that's some of my memories. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we, we came out of camp. I remember that. We came out in style, actually. Professor Emerson had a uh, 1929 green Lincoln touring car, 12-cylinder. He had two windshields. We took the top down. And we rode back to Pasadena in his car, uh, my family and I. I think Gary Hotta could remember that. He's on the thing. He, he came back. Dr. Emerson bought it, him and his family back, too, Professor Emerson. So I uh, I went to, so we lived in the predominantly black neighborhood in Pasadena. You see, in Pasadena, you could, only okay. whites could. So would this be an okay time to show the first grade picture of your class at Manzanar? What's that? Is this an okay time to show the first grade class picture at yeah. Manzanar? Oh yeah, go ahead and show it any time. We'll show you go about your life after camp. Okay, I, I guess they're going to put a picture of um, uh, our class, first grade class at Manzanar. Uh, that's our first grade class. I'm uh, I'm third from the right, sitting down. Gary Hata, who's on the on this session is second from the right. We're very good friends. And uh, George Iwamoto, who's a very close, he's on the, he's on this program too, he's listening. He, he's standing third from the right. 
we've been friends ever since then, and we we see each other all the time. Um, so we're still friends after camp. I've known Gary from uh, before camp because my grandmother used to babysit both him and I uh, before the war. Uh, uh, so anyway, we lived in the predominantly black neighborhood, and uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, I went to every school that Jackie Robinson went to from elementary school, junior high school, high school through junior college. You see, Jackie's parents lived right down the street from me on Pepper Street. We lived on Pepper Street. So that's something that, uh, uh, you know, we were all proud of as, uh, as the neighbor of Jackie Robinson. Uh, uh, after that, I, I came up north uh, after junior college to college and to, and I worked at uh, Lockheed, then I worked at IBM for a long time, then I did a startup, and then I retired after that. So that's my, my life. But uh, what I'd like to leave with you people, the young people, is that it's very important to remember how, what kind of hardship we went through, but you just don't know. You see, I spoke Japanese. I used to hear my grandmother talking to my grandfather. Um, the thing she couldn't get over was she felt her dignity was taken away. She kept telling my grandfather, I went to jail. I'm a tarnished person. I hope, I don't know if you can relate to that. You could never give, back, give her back her dignity. She died in shame. Anyway, the other thing I want to do is, uh, to you younger people, you know, some of our Issei's and the Nisei's, the 447 and the Nisei's, they left of a, they left of a legacy. You know, people like me who were successful because we stood on the shoulders of their legacy. I think we have to remember them and the legacy they left us, left us not only about the hardship they suffered, and I think we need to talk about that. And I hope you, all you audience out there, will remember that Japanese-American legacy. I think we're all proud Americans, but we're also proud, very proud Japanese-Americans. So that's, that's my story. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us, Ko. It's amazing. Um, there's a couple of questions for you, but we'll save them until the end. Um, we'll hear okay. now from um, Marge. Thanks so much, Co. Okay, we'll switch things up a little bit then, um, and then maybe we'll have Marge go after Marielle. So we'll switch. Is it my turn? Oh, no. Yeah, we're gonna have you and Marge switch. So Marge, um, yeah, okay. Or well, I think Marge might be on a call with someone else. So is it okay if you go right now? Oh, so you want me to go next? Yes, and let me know when you want me to show your pictures. Yeah, okay, I will. Um, I, I'd like to, to speak a little bit. First of all, um, you know, I want to uh, thank uh, the last speaker. Uh, let's see, it was uh, Ko Nishimura. That was very touching, Ko, and I appreciate you mentioning uh, your grandmother and the sacrifices that the Niseis made. You know, I was five, uh, a year older than Ko, but I don't really remember that much. And recently, I've been reading through the book that my mother wrote and marveling at the courage and, and the uh, determination of uh, the Nisei's. You know, the Issei's had come, they had built a life, they had struggled, and they thought that they had achieved their goal of leaving a, a, a legacy for their children that would have been better than what they had left in Japan and carved out here. It was just towards the end of the Depression. And in one section, uh, my mother relates how my dad was speaking about the neighbor whose 
just getting ready to pay off his mortgage and come out of the Depression. So by the, night, the late 1930s and the early 40s, the Japanese community was coming out of the Depression. Maybe, I don't know, a little ahead of the rest of the country, but there were families that were beginning to be successful. And my father points out that this was not a popular position. And it wasn't until the Japanese became a little bit more affluent that there was resentment in the community. And we all realized that there was a great deal of, of uh, prejudice against the Asians on the West Coast. Those who were here first didn't want the Asian communities to be successful. And the Japanese were just getting to that point. And so at that point, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. And we know the rest of the story it was the excuse to get us off the land. You know, in this area, uh, through some documentation, I know that 85% lost their property. My family didn't because we were one of the 15% that had somebody from the Caucasian community, Bob Fletcher, help us. And Bob was a more honorable person than many who were designated to take care of Japanese farmland. He had a legal document um, set up and agreed to share half the profits, which was not what my father originally asked him for. In fact, my dad asked him just to take care of his cousin's place and the neighbor and not ours. But Bob took care of 100 acres. And when we came back, he returned the land in good condition and half the profits. That is not the typical story. And the Nisei's, they all had such a difficult time. Imagine growing up, Florin was one of the few places where there was a segregated school. So my father writes about one day, all of a sudden, all the white children picked up their books, walked out of the building, went across the railroad tracks, literally to the new school. And the Japanese children were left behind. So from the time they were very young, they knew that they were not real Americans. That was the message that was sent from the community, and especially around foreign. And yet, you know, my grandparents had no real sense of loyalty to Japan. And I think if we could ask a lot of those Issei's, they didn't really want, they didn't support Japan. That was a story that was told by those who wanted to remove us off the West Coast and take a lot of the property, which they did. How many families lost property in what is now the middle of Silicon Valley? I can name some families that had farms there. And all that property was lost. That's the economic side. But the other side, the social side, what it did to that Nisei generation that came, that were born as American citizens, worked hard, and many of them were, were beginning to get college educations. And even though they had a college education, because I had an aunt and uncle, both graduated from UC Berkeley with degrees, but could not get jobs. My uncle had been accepted to law school there, but he came home because he knew he could never begin a law practice. And so all that was taking place at the same time that we were all of a sudden forced from our homes. And at that time, this was before the civil rights movement, the redress program, nobody thought that as American citizens, we could say anything. And so we didn't. And I'm so grateful to the national park system and especially Manzanar and the staff there, the superintendent, uh, Alyssa Lynch, who is a curator, Patty Briggs, who is one of the rangers there that's going around and taking oral histories. It's preserving the story about what happened to us because we were seen as less than first-class citizens. 
And we allowed ourselves to be that way because we had no means to fight that. There was nobody that was in uh, the state legislature to say, oh, this is wrong. There was nobody in Congress. And it wasn't until Hawaii became a state and we started be becoming a little bit more politically astute and, be and have more political power that we finally are telling our story. And I think virtual programs like this, the pilgrimage to Manzanar, the education program that Florin JCL puts on, and incidentally, Christine Umera is the chair of the Northern California Time of Remembrance program. And we have JACL chapters in the area, Florin, Placer County, Sacramento, and Lodi. And we all come together and support that program. And we talk about how important it is. This is our country, it's our constitution, but if we don't know how to protect it, then we will lose our rights. I'm sort of getting off topic, but, uh, you know, I, I, I want to go back and talk about camp. I've been reading parts of my mother's book again, and there's so much that I don't remember. But she talks about how devastating it was for her to realize as they went through the gates, the first assembly center in Fresno, and the gates closed, that she realized that she lost something very precious, our freedom. And we were sent in there like sheep, and we didn't know how to fight back because we had no power. But today, because of programs like this, and education programs that you, you have in San Jose and you know Southern California, Seattle, Portland, all over the United States where you're talking to teachers and educating the next generation that they not only know our story, but the reason for it is we have to be able to protect our rights as American citizens. And it was that Nisei generation that suffered so much. And I appreciate Yo talking about how his grandmother felt, because I think the Issei's did feel that way. They felt displaced. They felt never a part of this country or that this country did not want them. And my grandfather, when we were, when the Issei's were allowed citizenship, Sacramento County, I don't know who decided, but decided that Issei's applying for citizenship had to pass a test. I know in Los Angeles, they just took them to the fairgrounds and just swore them in, but my grandfather couldn't pass that test. And so he cried. And at age 88, he never became a citizen. So we have that blight on our country. That's part of our history. That's part of our story. But we can't let it stand. And there are still things happening today. And I'm so proud of Christine's granddaughter for standing up at Pseudo for Solidarity and speaking out because those immigrant children are in the same kind of conditions that we were, worse. At least we had our parents. And um, I just want to use this time to uh, say how grateful I am to the Nisei generation and how proud I am to be the daughter of Al and Mary Tsukamoto, who are very active in redress. And my mother, as a teacher, started an education program that I think has affected tens of thousands. And what Christine is doing with the uh, museum program is educating the next generation too. This program and others like it. And what the staff at uh, Manzanar is doing is incredible. It's outstanding. There's so many things that they are doing to pull people in, to tell them about history, but always focusing on um, the next step, which is the future. So um, I guess maybe you could show a few pictures. These are the pictures of camp. It's my family. Melanie, are you still on? Hello. Hi, Marielle. I, I'm going to show your pictures for you. Mel is kind of troubleshooting with um, 
Marge right now, so I can. She's gonna send the pics right now, so I will. <laughs> oh, you. Oh, <laughs> perfect. You know, this is um, Jerome, and we're standing, I think, outside uh, Block 9 somewhere. That's where our, our room was. Mm -hmm. That's my aunt, my uh, dad, my grandfather, and um, grandmother, and my mother and me. I was five. And when Yo talked about the searchlights, you know, I even as an adult, I was afraid of the dark for a long time. And I remember I wouldn't be able to sleep as a child even after we moved out of camp because uh, the shadows from the trees, you know, and the street lights would shine on the walls. And I think it was a memory of um, those searchlights going back and forth and casting shadows on the walls of, uh, of my room in Jerome. You know, so childhood memories, even though we say we don't remember a lot of things, they they affect us and they, they stay with us uh, for a long time. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That are important. Um, let's see, let's, let's actually take some questions. Um, was it, uh, some, a lot of people have asked about your mo mother's book, Marielle, and so can you tell, tell people a little bit about that? Yeah, I think you can get them at uh, Manzanar. Okay. Uh, also, uh, we we don't you can't get it on Amazon or anything. And my mother has a co-author, Elizabeth Pinkerton. But uh, you're welcome to contact me, and uh, I I think she now sells them for twenty dollars. And let me tell you, a hundred percent of all the sale of these books for the last thirty, forty, fifty years almost um, goes to a scholarship program. And so far, um, between uh, Elizabeth Pinkerton and myself, I think we've um, given out um, $60,000 in scholarships to high school students in the Oak Grove area. Perfect. Wow, that's amazing. It, it, all the money goes to scholarships. And it's called and uh, by Mary Tsukamoto and Elizabeth Pinkerton. Uh, you can put my email out and be happy to uh, mail it to you. There is a, like a $5 fee, I think, for postage. And if you live in Sacramento, I'll get it to you. Marielle is a fearless leader in the Sacramento Japanese American community. She's talked at so many different things, and she's such a great speaker, as you can tell. Um, let's take a few more questions. Let's see. Um, okay, so we have a question for um, all the panelists, so if any of you want to jump in. Um, I work mostly with youth who have been in detention centers at the border, ranging from weeks to several months. What advice would you give this group of students? Do you think it is a good idea to teach about the children at the internment camps and the Central American children detained today at detention centers? And that was from Nancy Rodriguez. So that was a panel of a question for everyone on the panel. I think it's important to um, to talk about what happened to us as children, but I think it's more important to talk about what the Japanese American community is trying to do in bringing attention to their plight and to maybe tell the story of uh, the origami crane and how it stands for peace. And if these teachers would like us to send origami cranes to them. Uh, I think we can afford to send some of them. We are, uh, you know, I, I mean, I'll commit to it from Sacramento. I don't want to dig into uh, the 125,000 cranes that we are trying to uh, make for the uh, March on Washington next spring. But I think we'll have more than 125,000. So I, I think it's okay to tell our story, but that's a history about the past. As a, as a former teacher, I'm thinking these children need a story that would be more hopeful. And they need to know that there are a lot of people that care about them. There are people that are trying to do something to reunite them with their parents and to get them out of this situation. 
So is that 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 is a great answer. Does anyone else have anything to add to that? Co, Christine, Tom. This is Christine. Can you hear me? Yes. I was able to go on the first Tudor for Solidarity pilgrimage to Crystal City and the protests at Dealey Detention Center. And from what happened there, I think it was f fabulous that we were able to share our stories. In fact, uh, the people who were incarcerated were really amazed. You know, why are you here? They couldn't get over. And once the people who were meeting with them explained that we were incarcerated too. I, I think what, one of the takeaways was that they had some hope that, you know, we survived that and that they can do that as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And the other thing is, if we're allowed to send books, you know, that might be a, a thing to do. Like I'm, I'm thinking of the book uh, Miss Breed. It's letters that third grade children wrote from, what was it, Topaz? Um, but, you know, there are books that we could send that talk about children in the camps. And, but, you know, the next question I'm going to ask is, these children that come from Latin American countries, can they read? And if they can read, do we need to be sending Spanish books? I, I think in question, and I, I believe that it would be a fair question to ask to see, number one, if we could give them some materials, and two, if the federal government will allow it. Oh, that's a great point. I think Marge is ready for us now. I think we've got her back for our microphone. So Marge, if you want to take it away. All right, Marge. Yeah. I think we're ready for you. Okay, thanks very much. Of, um, as I 
say being courageous, doing your research so that you know our history, uh, you know that over and over again this country has done to different populations the, the kinds of things that greedy people always do. Uh, and armed with that knowledge, you'll know how to proceed, uh, especially in terms of the climate uh, crisis that we're all in that will affect everyone, that uh, even with a pandemic that's facing us now, uh, those corporations and people in power are continuing to uh, put into place laws uh, that will make it more and more difficult for us to overcome uh, the centuries of uh, burning fossil fuels. So those are, are, are really my uh, words to um, those of you who are organizing this virtual pilgrimage uh, that um, you need to do your research, uh, choose what it is that you can change, where you can make a difference, and... Um, do that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Marge. All right, we are almost out of time now. I know that there's a lot of questions um, that are still unanswered in the group chat um, and the Q&A. Um, let's see, maybe we can answer a few more. Maddie, are you able to pick a couple out? Um, yeah. And then we'll quickly transition from the former incarcerated panel to the um, redress movement panel. Um, all of these former incarcerees are participating in the small group discussion, so cross your fingers and maybe you'll end up with one of them. They can pick their brain a little bit more. Um, I had, uh, there was a question. Um, as someone, oh, this is from Lauren Furukawa. I'm currently a college student in Long Beach, but I'm from San Jose with family from the foreign area and have family in Placer County. As someone who is aspiring to become a teacher, what do you think is the most important thing as a future educator to teach future generations? Uh, I'd like to quote what my mother said, Mary Tsukamoto. She's the one that I think understood that if you want to preserve what America stands for, you've got to have a generation of educated people who believe that too. And that is why I think that we need to teach that Americans do not have one kind of face. Yes, I agree. It's not white privilege that is American because the majority of people in the United States at some point, they're gonna to come to that tipping point will not be white. And the, the perception is that an American still is a white man, right? I think that's one of the most important concepts to teach. The second, we're the only country in the world, do you realize, that has a, a Bill of Rights? Other countries protect citizens' rights, it's in you know laws and things, but we are the only country with a Bill of Rights that's a part of the Constitution. So it's our constitutional obligation to teach that. That is a great point. I totally agree. Um, uh, oh, here we go. Here's another one. This was copied from Kathy Masoka from the chat. Can you speak to any examples of resistance in the camps and how has that inspired us as Japanese Americans? People often think that JAs went along and did not speak up at all. Does anyone have any examples of like how that was, uh, how that was felt. This will segue net great to our next presenter. So, just yeah. wanted to add in that one. Was Barbara today on the line? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, the people that ended up in in Tuli Lake for a lot of different reasons uh, stood up in a way 
you know, there, there's a whole range of, of reasons why people got, ended up in Tuvi Lake. Some because they were angry, some because they thought it was uh, constitutional rights. Uh, you know, and, and it's kind of like the Civil War. Uh, as a child that wasn't really involved in it, but my parents were. My parents were active in the JACL. And um, they were on the side that, you know, was the JACL message at the time, which was, uh, you know, they urged young men to join the military. And, and, you know, and certainly, I truly believe we wouldn't have gotten redress if it wasn't for the sacrifice of the veterans. And, and I have to say that if it wasn't for the record, the 442, and all that they suffered and all that they sacrificed and what they said they stood for and they did stand for it. From the symbolism of, of their 442 uh, you know, em emblem, which is the torch of liberty, they were immigrant sons fighting for liberty. And um, I, I think that's a message that, that is important. It is such an important message. Thank you for sharing, Marielle. I think that is also a great place to stop because we are now going to hear from people who were a part of the redress movement. Um, so we're going to take a quick break while we transition from um, our panelists of wonderful former incarcerates to um, Susan Hayase and Tom Izu and their son Tomio, who are a big part of the redress movement. So we will do that and then um, we'll get a little break and then we'll move on. So yeah, thank you so much to our panelists. Weren't they awesome? They shared great stories. It's always great to hear people who were actually there. So thank you so much.